Welcome um, back to our very first uh, virtual digital economy seminar in this fall semester. It's a great pleasure to welcome you again and uh, on this talk on platform economics. And uh, I wanted just to say that we do offer you this platform without payment, but you are, of course, paying with your time and attention, and we are very grateful for that. And um, our moderator today will be Christian Poikert, who is uh, at the University of Lausanne. He will introduce our uh, splendid speaker in a second. But first, uh, some uh, legal fine print, uh, as usual. For questions, if you have any clarifying questions um, throughout the talk, please send these to everyone in the chat window. And uh, Chris will then interrupt the uh, speaker at a convenient time and allow you to ask your question directly if you wish so or ask it for you. He will also collect questions for the Q&A after the talk in the same way. So don't hesitate to send questions via the chat at any time. Today's session will be recorded. So if you do ask a question yourself, you will appear in that recording on YouTube. All right, happy to hand over to Christian. Thanks, Hannes. So also from my side, welcome back to the Virtual Digital Economy Seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Belflam. Um, I'm sure everybody knows Paul and, and his work. Um, so not really need to go into too much detail, but uh, uh, Paul has been very uh, active in um, uh, developing theory on the digital economy, um, especially on, on platform markets. Um, I'm sure many of you use um, his textbook uh, in IO classes. He's also an associate editor at uh, all the well-known field journals, including a journal of, uh, of economics. So um, we are very happy to, to have you here and hear about your latest uh, project. Um, why don't you take it from here, Paul? Thanks a lot, uh, Hannes and, and Christian. Thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm quite impressed actually by, by the lineup of the seminar. So all these famous colleagues coming after me. So I have the impression that my talk today is a kind of supporting act. Um, and especially in view of the paper that I'm going to present, uh, I must say it's a kind of exercise that Martin Peitz and myself did as part of the forthcoming book, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the talk. Um, so we decided after discussing quite a lot whether we should make a paper out of it or not. And some people told us that it would be worth doing it. So here we are with this paper, but it's by no means something path breaking. Um, well, of course, you'll tell me all feedback is, of course, most, mostly welcome. So the title is Network Goods, Price Discrimination and Two-Sided Platforms. As I said, it's co-authored with Martin Bites. And in a, in a few minutes, let, let me first try to give you some kind of informal uh, presentation of what we're doing in the paper. And actually, we start with a very kind of philosophical, philosophical question, sorry, which is what makes a firm a platform? Now, you would probably answer like, uh, well, just look at the common definitions, right? And one of these definitions is the one by Evans and Schmalenzi. They, they, they tell us that a platform is a business that operates a physical or virtual place to help two or more different groups find each other and interact. The different groups are called sides of the platform. Now, if you apply this definition, you would have in mind platforms like the ones here, which can be called two or multi-sided platforms. And basically what they manage are cross-group network effects. More participation in one group would make the platform more attractive for the other group, okay? Now, if you apply strictly this definition, you would exclude another number of firms which are social networks, for example, or uh, communication apps, which I would call one-sided platforms because they target just one audience, but they do manage network effects, network effects within this audience. We call them within group or direct network effects. Now the question, should we treat these two types of platforms uh, alike? Should we call them, all of them platforms? Well, this is what we contend. We wanna take a broader view and we see two main reasons for which we shouldn't treat, treat these types of platforms differently, one-sided or two-sided. The first reason, which is perhaps minor, is that you have within group network effects on many two-sided or multi-sided platforms. Uh, think of competition between uh, sellers on eBay, for example. Think of any congestion you can find on, on different types of platforms within a particular group of users. Now, the, the main reasons for which we, we think that these different types of platforms should, should be treated alike 
is what we uh, explain in this paper. We show that what matters is not so much the presence of different audiences that you can distinguish, but what really matters is the capacity for the platform to use a different sets of a different set of instruments. Okay, so that's our first message. The definition of multi-sided platforms should not rest on easily distinguishable groups of users, but on the ability to target groups with different prices. So actually what I will present is a model where we have a network good. So we have a platform which is targeting a single audience. All users generate network effects for all users. Okay, but the platform is able to um, distinguish across different subgroups of users. So tell users apart according to their types. And if the platform is able also to price differently these different groups, then the price discrimination program of this platform looks very much like the problem of a multi-sided platform. Okay, so that's the whole first message. The second message is that this insight can be generalized to situations where this platform is not able to tell users apart, but induces some form of self-selection by proposing a menu of versions which are priced differently. Okay, and here, what we show is that in our setting, basically the incentive compatibility constraints are not binding. And because of that, this versioning problem, second degree price discrimination, leads to an outcome which is the same as the third degree price discrimination problem uh, that you would have if the platform can actually tell users about. Okay, so that's the second message. And we apply this to a specific form of versioning, which is the freemium strategy, where one version would, would be given uh, for free to some users and another version would be uh, charged to other users. Okay. Now, we're not the first uh, to, to make this connection between a two-sided and, let's say, one-sided platforms. I'm going to just take a few... Um, quotes here, I'm not going to go through all this, but just look at what I have highlighted in, in yellow. Uh, this, this is coming from uh, the, the 2006 Roger Tirol paper. And they, they, they explain that the theory of two-sided markets is related to the theories of network externalities and of uh, multi-product pricing. Okay, and um, you can read, or you probably already read uh, the rest of the quote um, earlier. Now, two other quotes coming from uh, Bruno Julien, uh, an earlier paper in 2001, when he says, one feature of modern networks that has not received considerable attention is that network effects are often not isotropic. Members may join for different reasons and value both the service and the participation of others in very different ways. Okay, so there are these differences across uh, users of the network goods, which uh, makes it possible for the platform to practice price discrimination. And similarly, in his 2011 paper, uh, Bruno writes, it is not crucial to have effectively several sides to generate multi-sided market effects. The ability to price discriminate along with the presence of network effects suffices. Okay, so this is pretty much the intuition that we have and that we actually formalize in our model. Now, Doing so, we, we kind of uh, borrow or relate to different strands of literature. I'm not going to go through all these papers, uh, and you probably know most of them. But there is a connection, of course, between the pricing of network goods and these seminal papers by Katz and Shapiro and Farrell and Salona. And obviously, with the new, uh, the, 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 the relatively more recent literature on multi sided platforms, started with Borchette Tirol and Armstrong, for example. Then we can also make a connection, and we do this uh, in the paper with the, the literature on pricing in social networks. And you've got a bunch of papers there that have similar results um, to the ones we have. And obviously, we also make a connection between price discrimination and network effects. And uh, you've got there two papers that do the same. And especially when we talk about the Freeman model, uh, what we present is similar to what has been presented, for example, by Takayama when she was talking of pirated goods and also by a Sorba uh, having a, a model of freemium. So just to expand on this very quick uh, literature review, um, what we try to do somehow is to, to, to give a, a sort of con conceptual link between 
these different uh, strands of literature, um, as I mentioned them, the pricing of network goods, multi-sided platforms, but also networks as graphs and price discrimination. And basically the bridges between the first two using the last two. Um, so how do we move from pricing of network goods to multi-sided platforms? Well, in general, it would be a question of information and instruments. But in some environments, and we provide one of these environments, we show that it may only be a question of instruments. OK, so to make this a bit clearer, uh, let me show you um, uh, a kind of um, a very uh, short uh, review of what we do. Um, so there are two dimensions here. Uh, on, on the horizontal axis, if you want, we, uh, we ask whether the, the, the operator is able to use more than one price instrument. Okay, and there is a, a related question as to whether the, the platform operator has information about users, allowing the operator to, to tell users apart. Okay, so obviously on the left hand side, when the, the, the operator is restricted to one price instrument, um, well, the question about inf information becomes irrelevant. And we have there the, the, the usual network pricing problem where the operator chooses one price in the presence of uh, network effects, the same price for all users. Now, the first contribution we make is to look at the case where the operator has some uh, information about users and especially is able to tell users apart. So recognizing that there are different types of users within this single audience, right? We, we're still talking about direct network effects. And there we show that group pricing, so the ability to set different prices to users in different groups, amounts to a problem of uh, multi-sided platform pricing. Okay. And then we show that, sorry, in some environments, uh, you can even li lift the constraint or the, the requirement that the operator needs to have information about users. So it's possible to replicate with a menu of options uh, the, the results that would be obtained by knowing who the consumers are. So versioning here uh, can actually lead under certain conditions to the same outcome as group pricing. OK, so that's basically the, the summary of what we do uh, in the paper. The rest now is uh, going through the formal model. OK, well, before I do that, I forgot I had this slide. Um, some comments about these results. Um, so one implication, and I, I'll list more implications at the end of the presentation. But if you, if you see a social network as a one-sided platform, what we say is that you can also see it somehow if there, was, if there is group pricing as a multi-sided platform. And there, the analogy with the results we know in multi-sided platforms is that it may be optimal for the platform to cross-subsidize um, and have a lower price for lower types users, for example. Okay. Now, the, the technical uh, result that we have about versioning being sometimes equivalent to group pricing, that deserves some, some explanation before we even go to the model. So what are the conditions for this to hold? Well, one particularity of the model we have is that, um, well, sorry, the, the result is due to the fact that the incentive compatibility constraints are non-binding in the optimal menu. Where does this come from? Well, it comes from the fact that we assume two-dimensional heterogeneity of user types in our model and a discrete set of qualities. Okay, so what is important uh, though is that this result doesn't rely on the presence of network effects. Okay, now why is it that we have this formal equivalence between group pricing problem uh, with network effects? Well, if you consider the standard menu pricing problem without any network effects, um, the prices for the consumers of different types would be interdependent because of the binding incentive compatibility constraints. In our setting, the interdependence only comes from the network effects because the incentive compatibility constraints are not binding. In a more general setting, you would have the two sources of interdependency. Uh, both the network effects and binding IC constraints would make the prices uh, interdependent uh, across users in the profit maximizing price structure. Okay, so I'll come back to this in the formal model, but uh, it was worth mentioning it here already. Right, so I don't know whether I should pose here uh, to answer potential questions. Um, 
Hannes or Christian, let me know. So far, we, we don't have any, any questions or comments. Okay, so let's jump into the, the model now. Right, so very, um, I would say, um, normal or uh, usual model of a monopoly uh, pricing a, a good or a service. So we've got a mon monopoly platform that offers interaction possibility to a set of users. Okay, see this is a network good. Take the example of, uh, of Spotify. Well, this is the one we take. Why do we consider Spotify as a one-sided platform? Well, because Spotify basically organizes the interaction among the, the audience, the, the users, the listeners, if you want, by providing um, such things like recommendations. Okay, uh, And we all understand that the quality of the recommendations we receive increases with the number of users. So the more data Spotify is able to, uh, to collect on the users, the better the recommendation it can make to any users. So it's a form of within group network effects, which is managed by the platform. Okay, As you will see uh, in a minute, this is encapsulated by the fact that the network effects are, di are direct. Every user benefits from any additional user in the network. Okay, Now, the, we contrast two types of pricing, actually three. We will take uniform pricing as a benchmark, but we assume that the, the monopoly platform has the ability to observe part or, or everything of the user's type, or well, at least part. Okay, either, and this would be group pricing, uh, the platform is able to uh, observe characteristics of the users and put them in different segments. Okay, or it doesn't have this possibility but nevertheless can propose a menu of different uh, services, so different price quality pairs. Okay, so we'll contrast uh, group pricing and versioning uh, and uniform pricing. Now, users, they observe all prices in the second stage, and then they take simultaneously their decision whether to join the network or not. Okay, what is their net utility? Um, so consider a user of some type I, some group I, right? And we assume uh, a, an arbitrary number of groups larger than two, which would be equally uh, represented. And so the, the net utility is given by these three elements. There is a standalone benefit, which may differ across types. There is a network benefit, which is a product of some strength or intensity of network benefits and the network size. Okay, so this network benefit can also be um, uh, depending on the group, on the type of the, the user. And as I said, this is within group network effects or direct network effect because capital N here is the total number of users, so the addition of the numbers of each group I. Okay, and potentially uh, the price PI will also be uh, depending on either the group to which the consumer belongs or uh, maybe conditioned by the version that is targeted towards, towards this particular group. Okay, we've just, as I said, considered a benchmark where the price PI is the same for every uh, group. Okay, so how do users decide, make the decision at the second stage of the game? Well, we assume that they compare the net utility to some outside option, which we assume is uniformly distributed and the distribution is independent on the distribution of the characteristic i. Okay, and we assume that an increase of the net utility of some amount equal to one would increase the number of users by a mass one. Okay, so this is to say basically, this is what we have here. Uh, the decision to participate is the net utility should be larger than the outside option. And there is exactly a number n i of such users which have an X lower than this. Okay, so that gives you implicitly, sorry, this should be a capital N here uh, and here as well. Um, but that gives you implicitly the, the demand function for users in group I. How do you solve this? Well, if you sum um, over all types, you've got this um, equation here. You understand my notation. So capital N is the sum of the NI. Capital R is the sum of the Ri's, capital B is the sum of the beta i's, and capital P is the sum of the P i's over all i's, so over the capital I groups of users. 
Now you can sort for the total number of users, plug this back in here. And so you've got the demand function if you, if you want for participation in group I as a function of all the prices. And we want uh, the demand to decrease with all the prices. So we impose that the intensity of network effects should uh, is not too large. And this is uh, how we translate this in the model here. Okay. Now, how do we proceed? Well, we can move to the first stage where the, the platform is choosing prices. And as a benchmark, we take the case of uniform pricing. I'm going to be quite quick here. I mean, uh, I've put a lot of expression, mathematical expression just to impress you, but this is rather simple to do. Just uh, note here that the same price is chosen for all users and the firm is obviously cho choosing this price to maximize its profit. Here, there is no cost. I forgot to say that. So it's maximizing revenues and revenue is P, the common price times the number of users. We are, we are, you are, you've understood that the decision is to join the platform or not. And this is a, an access fee P. So you just multiply the number of users by this access fee to get the total revenues. Okay, and doing this, you find easily this uniform price that maximizes profit. It's half the average standalone benefit. So R bar is R, capital R divided by I, okay? You can compute the number of users in each group uh, at th this optimum and also the profit that the firm is making, okay? So forget about these numbers. What will uh, be important uh, later is to compare this profit to the profit that the firm can make in the group pricing. We know it's gonna be larger, of course, in the group pricing. What is more interesting perhaps is to compare the prices that we will have in the group pricing to this benchmark. Okay, so let's turn to group pricing. Um, so now the platform knows who is who. Okay, as some user is recognized to, to be in group I, for example, and so will be charged a particular price PI. Okay, so we've got a problem here of third degree price discrimination, um, which is rather simple again, because we assume that costs are, are zero and are separable in a sense across groups. Um, and so going through the whole thing, um, well, first result, which is not surprising at all, but it's good to, um, to check it. If you use the first order condition, which is here, and compare the prices for two groups, well, it's kind of obvious that if group I has a larger uh, standalone benefit than group K, or values the network benefits more than group K, then PI is going to be larger than PK. So uh, group I is going to be charged a larger price than uh, group K will be. Okay, so that gives you already the structure, some idea of the structure of prices. Now, what are these prices going to be? Um, well, here, just for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on one case, which is homogeneous network benefits. So here, all users across types enjoy the network benefits in the same way. Okay, so beta I would be equal to beta for all groups. Um, we can solve uh, the other case where the homogeneity would be in standalone benefits. Uh, we do so in the paper, um, but let's concentrate on this one, which is uh, simpler to present. And I should say also that in the other case, the results are, are very, uh, very similar, uh, very quali qualitatively similar. Okay, so this is how, what the first order condition would become. Then you again can solve uh, over all groups, and you've got the, the, the value for the, the, the sum of the prices, which you can plug back into the price for group I. And basically, this is what you find. Okay, you may be surprised that the, the strength of the network effects doesn't appear here. Well, um, everything is linear here. And so if, if you were solving the same type of price discrimination problem with linear demands and linear costs, you would also have this kind of, uh, of situation. So just remember that the price for group I and the group pricing would be just half of the standalone benefit enjoyed by this group. Here you have the, the number of users on the group pricing in group I and here the profit. Okay, again, there is nothing extremely exciting to get out of the expression. What we want to do is to compare the two, of course. Okay, so let me start with the second um, result, which is not surprising. We, of course, 
we know that profits will be larger when the firm has more information and is able to, um, to price discriminate. What's interesting here is that the increase in profit that group pricing allows the firm to achieve is proportional to the variance of uh, the standalone benefits. Okay, so group pricing is more profitable with respect to uniform pricing, the more the valuations of the standalone utility are dispersed across groups. Okay, now perhaps what is more interesting is to look at prices and participation levels in the two uh, settings. Um, and the result is here. Um, so remember G is for group pricing and U is for uniform. You see the difference in price is proportional to the difference between RI and R bar. R bar is the average uh, standalone benefit, and RI is the, the standalone benefit for group I. Okay, and it's the other way around for the participation levels. Okay, it's uh, proportional to the inverse uh, R bar minus RI. Okay, so the result is here in words. If you've got a group that values the standalone benefit above the average of all groups, then this group is going to be charged a higher price and will participate less under group pricing than under uniform pricing. Okay, so you, you've got a sense of how the platform is uh, adapting the price structure when it is able to uh, recognize uh, who is who. Okay, now something which is not surprising, of course, but which is good to highlight is to show how the platform takes into account the network effects, which I wouldn't call cross-group network effects, but you understand what I mean. The cross-group effects are, uh, sorry, the, the network effects are direct here, okay? But nevertheless, you've got different groups of users, right? And to understand how the existence of these different groups of users is taken into account by the platform, we compare to a, a kind of thought experiment where the platform would be cut in two, in a sense, with two divisions, one division focusing on one group and another division focusing on another group, okay? Well, I've, I've focused now two groups, right? But we can exactly do the same reasoning for N groups, but it will be easier to present if there are only two groups, okay? So imagine that you've got these two divisions or two separate um, managers, which would focus on the audience in their group, taking the participation in the other group as something given. Okay, so this is what we write here. The, the demand function that the, the manager of uh, division A would take into account would be this one. It understands that there is this, these reinforcing effects within group A, but it doesn't take into account the fact that by changing the price for group A, it would also change participation in group B which would also feed back into the participation in group A. So this separate or isolated uh, um, manager would take participation in group B as something fixed, okay? Now, if you look at the profit maximization problem of this manager uh, and uh, use the first order condition to derive the optimal price, well, you get something which is larger than the price I showed you before. Remember, uh, the, the price in the group pricing would be just RA divided by two. And here we add something positive. Okay, so we check the intuition we had and which is the same intuition in a multi-sided platform problem that the monopolist internalizes the network effects by lowering the price on each group in order to foster more participation, which is beneficial uh, for all groups because it generates more participation, so more revenues for the platform. Okay, so again, nothing really a path breaking here, but the, the model allows us to, uh, to check all these intuitions. And again, I repeat the message is that it looks like a two-sided uh, or multi-sided platform uh, pricing problem, but remember that we have direct network effects. It's not just group A influencing group B and group B influencing group A. Every user is influencing every user in this uh, network um, one-sided platform. Right, so that was the first message. Now, the second one, uh, remember, is to say that the same intuition applies even in situations where the platform would not be able to tell users apart. Okay, so it doesn't have this information when, uh, it, uh, when a user 
draws a platform, the platform doesn't know whether this user belongs to group I, group J, or group K, or whichever group. Okay, but nevertheless, we will show now that the platform would is able to achieve the same outcome as in the group pricing by proposing a menu of options. So by practicing versioning. Okay. Now I stick to the, the simpler example with two groups. And I build a, a situation where uh, my result would obtain. Okay. And so imagine that now there is also a basic version of the product which is valued the same by both groups at R, okay? And group A, you can think of this group as the I end consumers, they would put some extra value delta on having a premium version, okay? But this premium version doesn't bring any additional value to group B, okay? Now, if self-selection takes place in a correct way, group A would buy the premium version and group B would buy the basic version generate participations at the level of NA and NB. And so the problem would look exactly like the one we considered for group pricing. Okay, so here is the, the, the net utility for group A members, the net utility for group B members, okay? If you substitute R plus delta for RA and R for IB, RB, well, you've got the same problem as before. And so the solution to this problem not taking any constraints into account so far would be the PA and PB that I showed you before, namely PA is equal to RA over two and PB is equal to RP over two. Okay, so this is what we have here. Okay, now of course, for this to work in the versioning setting, we need to check whether at these prices, the incentive compatibility constraints are satisfied. Okay, and especially the one for the high end consumers, the, the, those in group A. Okay, so we check whether the, the net utility they obtain if they do buy the premium version is larger than the net utility they get if they buy the basic version. And actually it does, okay? And I mean, the constraint is not binding. Okay, so we've proved here, we've built an example where the versioning, uh, which is based on two versions targeted at different groups and having the group self-select for these two versions, well, this versioning problem works with the same prices as in the group price. Okay, so the same profit can be achieved by the platform, even though it's not able to tell users apart. It doesn't have as much information as in the previous case. Okay, so that leads us to this proposition here. Okay, um, let me read it with you. When users of a network good benefit from standalone utilities of different versions of a network goods to a varying degree, a monopolist can profitably introduce different versions of the same network good, inducing consumer self-selection. In some environments, like the one we provide, the profit-maximizing strategy replicates the same outcome as the profit-maximizing strategy chosen by the multi-sided platform, which identifies the various groups of users and provides the respective standalone utilities to the distinguishable groups. Shortcut versioning gives the same outcome as group pricing. Okay. Now, we so, go one step further and show that an application of this result is actually a freemium strategy. We just need to set R is equal to zero, meaning that group B would obtain uh, the goods or can join the platform for free, okay? If you redo the math with R is equal to zero, here are the, the, the equilibrium or the, the, up, the profit maximizing, uh, so prof, where am I here? The profit maximizing, uh, okay, I'm here. The profit maximizing participation levels and the profit of the platform. Okay, so you see here that no revenue is coming from group B. They, they get access for free, right? But indirectly, having them on board through the free version creates revenues for the platform because more participation in group B increases the willingness to pay for group A, and this is captured by the platform. Okay, so I think you should all be convinced with that, but if, if, if you're not, uh, I mean, you just can just go back to the model and assume an alternative situation where uh, actually the platform would only sell the product to group A and not offering it to group B. And in that case, uh, the price, optimal price would be PA tilde, which I haven't computed, but if you compare 
the difference in profits is clearly positive here. Okay, so in words, if the platform was focusing only on group A and not offering free access to group B, uh, it would make lower profits. Okay, so this is the proof that even though group B doesn't directly contribute by paying for access, it indirectly contributes by raising the willingness to pay of group D. Okay. So and for those of you who are on Twitter, I mean, I gave yesterday this example that I found in the press, which is exactly that. Netflix is launching in Kenya a, a free uh, version of its uh, service, um, hoping that people will later convert. Well, but in a static model, there is already a contribution by these free users generating more data that Netflix can use to improve the service for paying users and thereby generate more revenues. So Paul, if I may interrupt, we have yeah, a sure. question by Binay Kumar. I'm going to unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. Yeah, he hello, I have a question rather too. So first, suppose there are say 10 groups of customer, then how one group become aware about what price is being paid by another group? And, uh, second, yeah. and second question is based on what characteristic of customers, uh, the focal form put in different groups. So is there any overriding characteristic? I'm not sure to get your second question, but as for the first, this is a very good point. I mean, we implicitly assume here that all users can observe, observe all prices. Yeah. As is usually done in any price discrimination problem, and it's also done uh, on, on multi-sided platforms. Now, this is a good point because, well, Martin and I have another paper on the observability of prices on multi-sided platforms. And I think there, this is quite a big assumption to assume that users can actually observe prices for the other group, especially on platforms where the two groups of users are very different types of users. So if you think of video game consoles, on the one hand, you've got users like you and me, gamers. On the other side, you've got game developers. And it's yeah. not clear at all whether us as users have a sense of what game developers pay or are paid by the platforms. So mm -hmm. when users are of very different types, I would say this question of observability of prices is really a key assumption. Now, in the, the, the model we have here, on the situations we describe here, we still think of the same audience. So all participants to Facebook, for example, or all uh, people using um, Spotify. And there, I think it's reasonable to assume that you know what type of prices are practiced by, by uh, Spotify. I mean, you can have a list, uh, look at the, the website of Spotify, and you will have the list of prices for different options. Okay, in the versioning strategy, you, you know which price uh, are linked to different versions and you make your choice based on that. Okay, so I guess in, in our case, the, the, the assumption of all prices being observable is perhaps uh, less of a problem than it would be in, in multi-sided contexts. Now, um, if, you, if you can repeat your second question, because I, I, I frankly, I didn't get it. Yeah, actually, uh, thank you for answering this first question. And second question is, uh, as a user, so there are different types of subscribers on any, any platform. So on which particular characteristic uh, this platform segregate them in the different groups? That was my interest. Yeah, good point. I mean, again, this is a kind of general question for any price discrimination uh, problem. And especially when you talk about versioning, um, the, first, there is, I mean, managers or people in management science would be uh, more at ease to talk about that. But, I mean, you need to do some market research to know what kind of um, dimension is important for some users and less for others. Okay. Um, so that would be the general segmentation. How can you, in a relevant way, uh, partition your market in different segments? In our case, uh, what really matters is the way users value either the standalone benefits or the network benefits. Okay, and you can think of uh, different types of users who would put different value of interacting with others with respect to whichever um, standalone service they can use. Okay, um, I'm trying to find an example here from the top of my head. Um, well, I mean, think of Dropbox, right? Um, 
some people will use Dropbox just for uh, storing their own files and they don't really care uh, sharing files with others. So these people would have relatively more weight on the standalone uh, value than on the, the network value. But for other people, it's just the opposite. They, they may have, I mean, sufficient uh, storage space on their computer or another service, for example, from the university, and they would just use Dropbox to share with others. So for them, um, the, the value on the network benefit would be much uh, more important than the value of the standalone uh, benefit, if you see what I mean. Yeah, thank you so much. It's very clear now. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Other questions, Christian, now? Uh, at the moment, not. Okay, good. Okay, go ahead. So let, let me move on. Um, I'm reaching the end, basically. Um, I told you that this is a supporting act. It's, it's usually shorter than the, the main act. So what, what are potential implications of, of these results? Well, we've presented it in, in the usual way, uh, talking about a firm choosing prices. Well, if you think about social networks, um, and especially of this, this freemium strategy, we know that not everything is free or sometimes you pay with your data or uh, by some, some form of invasion of, of your privacy. Okay, so you can think more generally what we presented as different menus of a uh, menu of different options. These options differing not so much by the price, but maybe differing in terms of how much your privacy is protected. Okay, or how much data you are induced to, to leave to the platform. Okay, now, what is important if you think of this uh, alternative interpretation is that any form of intervention by regulators saying, for example, that uh, privacy of users should be um, protected, which may make a free version no longer free. Um, what we need to keep in mind is that that will have an implication on the whole structure of prices or the whole design of the menu of, of versions that the platform is going gonna, is gonna to choose. So not just the, the, the users that were consuming the so-called free version would be affected, but other users as well. Okay. And as we show, as we have just shown, it's through the network effects and not so much through the incentive compatibility constraints that this kind of interdependence will, will play. Now, another uh, other regulatory implications, um, which are direct consequences of what we shown, what we have showed, sorry, uh, is that platform may lack consumer data, so may not be able to um, to set users apart, right? And so we would have to resort to versioning. And as you know, one way to create versioning is to start with a the, an original version of the product and propose another version by downgrading it. Okay, so you would propose a, a damaged goods strategy as it is called. Okay. Um, now, if, yeah, so that may have impacts not only on the, on those who consume the premium, uh, the, sorry, the, the basic version of the damaged good, but also those who consume the premium version. So again, that's just, I'm repeating the same stuff, right? So any regulation that would make this not possible would prevent the platform from offering these damaged goods would hurt all the users because an extra source of network effects may be, may be cut, okay? And the same thing goes for the, the second bullet point here. If the regulation would impede any form of discrimination among users, so would prevent the firm from uh, applying any form of price discrimination, then again, I mean, it may have a direct negative effect by uh, reducing the market. Some, some consumers would drop out, but doing so, they would also reduce the total network effects. And so the, the well-being of those users that remain on the platform. Okay. Now, of course, this kind of reasoning depends on the relationship between or the ranking between the private and the social benefits from data. Okay, so we need to be careful not to generalize this uh, too, too quickly. Finally, if, if we have to derive some implications for managers, um, well, I mean, the example of, of uh, that I gave of uh, Netflix uh, offering this free service in Kenya, Usually that would be presented as uh, a kind of dynamic strategy. So you, you would give a free version as a way to um, increase the willingness to pay of users in face of an experience good. So people would try it for free, 
realize that they like it and later pay for it. Okay. Now, what we say is that there is another motivation, even from a static point of view, to uh, use this kind of freemium strategy, because having more users on this free segment generates more data, more network effects that can be captured by the platform to improve the service for other users uh, on, the, on the network. Okay, so it's not just converting users and exploiting the fact that at some point they will pay, it's also exploiting the fact that these free users may make existing users pay more or being more satisfied. Okay, now one other way to read our results is to say that if you want to um, tell, well, advise a platform how to grow and how to scale their operations, well, usually the, the, the advice which is given is that why don't you take another group of users on board? Okay, so by that would allow more interaction on the platforms, create more network effects, create a larger portfolio of services, and so on and so forth. Well, in a way, we, we kind of give the opposite advice here. Why don't you try to segment a given existing group of users into subgroups and exploit what we have just shown, uh, the difference in their willingness to pay either for standalone benefits or for network benefits, and so amplify somehow the network effects within uh, existing consumers rather than taking another group of consumers on board. Okay, so this could be done by having a special treatment for influential users, for example, or users that derive a particularly high value from the service. Okay, but then came back, we came back to the question I received previously, how do you identify this? Well, this is uh, another answer. You, you need to find this dimension uh, that is relevant to segment users within a particular group. Okay. And finally, well, this is the main message uh, we could give from a managerial point of view. Uh, it's not because you target a single audience that you shouldn't take, uh, take into account these dynamics or these uh, effects which are present on a multi-sided platform. Okay, so, and especially if the structure of the, the, the social network matters, um, not only it's important to uh, for example, uh, recognize that some users may have more connection than others and may be more influential. But also, that was a second message. You don't need to have a precise knowledge of who these users are because somehow you can replicate what you would achieve through group pricing with uh, a, a well chosen set of options under version. Okay. And I think that's it. And that's my moment where I do some form of uh, advertising. So maybe you know, but uh, we have a first book coming soon with, uh, with Martin uh, called The Economics of Platform, Concepts and Strategy. The second book, I mean, we're working on it, would be about regulation and competition. But hopefully this one will be available very soon, uh, perhaps earlier in, under the ebook format than under the, um, the, the print format. And just uh, to apply what we say here, we have a freemium strategy as well. The slides will be available for free. The book notes. I mean, Cambridge University Press would not allow that. They have cost to cover, but the price is uh, going to remain uh, as low as possible. So that was my uh, self-promotion. Thank you for your, your attention. Thanks so much, Paul. Um... Uh, yet another very nice book that I'm definitely going to put in my in my shelf. And um, I already tweeted about this. I really appreciate that you always make the teaching material available on your website. I think that's super helpful. Um, we have a, a couple of questions. Um, let's start with Hannes Ulrich. Um, Hannes, do you want to go ahead? Uh, I thought it was second, but that's fine. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul, for the uh, great talk. So, so I, I've kept thinking, um, so Joshua Gans, he presented a paper in this seminar on zero pricing by a monopolist. And, and, and I found there's some similarities. So I think in his model, uh, uh, so con there's consumer-specific cost and they're uh, heterogeneous and they might be below zero. Uh, so in the network, um, good or on a platform that could be the other consumer's benefit that can be turned into revenues, I, I suppose. And uh, and uh, so I was wondering in particular with the freemium uh, uh, model, um, whether, um, s whether your paper is essentially putting the, the network aspect on this, or if this is something to think about completely differently. No, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, 
the kind of global way to see this is that there is some form of complementarity between two products or two versions, right? Um, and you use one as a loss leader, as they would say uh, in marketing, I guess. Um, so you lower the price on one to increase the demand on the other and collect revenues there and hopefully recoup what you've lost or not gained on the loss leader. Now, um, I mean, there is no reason why the price should stay above marginal costs, right? It could go below. And we've got exactly the same uh, type of, uh, of intuition in two-sided markets where you often have one group which is subsidized and the other one, the money group, which would pay uh, a positive fee. So the complementarity here comes from the network effects. Okay, in a multi-sided market, two-sided market, the, the, the network effects are limited across the groups. Okay, um, now here you've got um, direct network effects among a single audience, but as we've shown, if you can segment this audience into several groups and exploit the, the differences among them, uh, you can basically have exactly the same, uh, the same intuition. Okay, but behind this, you've got this idea that by lowering the price on one side, you increase participation, which uh, would increase the willingness to pay of other users. And if you have the ability to have a separate price for these users, you can actually uh, recoup the kind of in investment you've made by lowering the price on the first group. Yeah. Thanks. And in a sense, the damage good strategy is um, I mean, even if the price is zero of this damaged good, if it costs you more to produce it, um, it's as if you had a price. Uh, I mean, you may, what I'm saying is that you may even have negative or make losses uh, on one group, uh, which may be optimal if you can recoup sufficiently these losses with the revenues on the other group. Thanks. Um, next up is Ido Eisdorfer. You are on YouTube. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, by the I enjoyed the lecture a lot, Paul. So it was fascinating. I just wanted to ask you: uh, Do you hear me? Yep. Ah, okay. Uh, isn't it Spotify has two actually two main groups? One are the musician who creates music, while the others with the listeners. I understood from the model that you are focusing on the listeners. That's therefore I can understand the intuition for the entire model, but the musicians who create music has other incentives in Spotify. So I think that Spotify is from the audience side, is, it's one um, one-sided platform, but from the musician side, it's something else. So Spotify itself, I'm not sure that it's like Facebook, which is a one-sided platform. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Facebook is a, well, you can also discuss about Facebook and say that advertisers would be the other side, but they are clearly there to monetize the platform and there are negative cross-site network effects. Mm -hmm. But coming back to Spotify, I mean, I mean that's the kind of debate we have uh, uh, in the profession, I would say. But it's, I think for me, it's hard to argue that musicians are uh, the other side in the sense that they would really decide to join or not the platform uh, and benefit from cross-group network effects from the audience. Um, the way Spotify is organized is that it kind of buys the rights to distribute the music and it buys mm -hmm. them from uh, the, 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 the majors, right? The, the record companies. Uh, so the, the, the link with the artist is indirect. It's not as if artists were free to actually be on the platform. Um, but when I'm saying that, I, I realize this is not the entire truth. So it's somewhere in between. I know. I know Spotify. So yeah. there is an incentive for even a new musician to upload their music in order to get the network effect. Yeah. And by that, they can uh, get money out of it. Yeah. But I mean, a, a purer model than Spotify in that respect would be SoundCloud, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So you don't have any intermediary like the majors. Um, mm -hmm. And here, I mean, in my in my view, Spotify is more like, um, well, like Walmart in a sense. I mean, they, they buy a lot of stuff and they mm -hmm. put it at display for the consumers. But nevertheless, they are trying to, uh, to target more directly the, 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 the independent artists now by providing them with a lot of services as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's somewhere in between. I, I, I agree with you, this is not the perfect example. 
uh, okay. WhatsApp. But for WhatsApp, it was harder to see how you could distinguish between different types of users. I don't see much price discrimination there. Mm -hmm. But for, for Spotify, I mean, the, 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 you've got group pricing, you've got versioning, you've got all sorts of price discrimination. Uh, yeah, you are right. From the audience side, it's perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We don't know what happens on the other side. I mean, the deals okay. are, are much more secret. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yep. So I guess we have time for one or two more questions. Um, so next up is uh, Timo Tiersch, Dodigalski. I'm going to unmute you. I think it's a very related question. Let's see. There you go. Hi, uh, in fact, yeah, this is a related question, but a good point about mentioning the one-sided uh, platform, because usually these are the two-sided or uh, multi-sided platforms that get most of, uh, most of the attention. However, like the one-sided do not get it. Um, but yeah, this is the question about the definition of a platform. For me, a platform is a place where uh, users may interact with each other. And this is this may happen in one group or in between two groups. So. Uh, we agree here, but I don't think that Netflix is a platform. Like for me, there are no network effects there. Like this is, this is, they are high economies of scale. And for me, this is like content provider is somehow what you mentioned in other words and not platform per se. And that's it, thank you. Okay, so um, I, I'm happy with the definition you give a platform because if you read our book, this is the one we use as well. So they, they need to be some interaction and network effects and some operator managing there. Okay, so whether it's cross group or within group doesn't really make a difference for our purpose, which is to, to look at the economics of platforms and also derive some meaningful um, intuition about how these platforms, for example, should be regulated, how they choose the strategies and so on and so forth. Now, why we treat Netflix as a platform is because they organize in our view, within group network effects for the audience. So as soon as you put in place a recommendation system and you have this system being fed by all the data coming from uh, the, the profiles of all the users, well, there is a form of network effects in the group of users. And users realize that the more users participate, the better the recommendation they will receive. Okay, now again, there is a debate about whether this is economies of scale on the supply side or economies of scale on the demand side. I would say it's on the demand side because it's directly from the behavior of the users. I mean, the users by using the platform create a network effects for other users. Okay, and this is important, of course, this is mitigated, managed by the platform. Okay, so this is the way we see it. All right, um, another question on uh, definition of platform by Lucas Andrini. Luca, do you wanna go ahead? Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was just, uh, it seems to me that often the, the, the platforms and I take the, the and I use the, the Spotify example, offer like this freemium kind of business model scheme and when consumers join the free version of the platform, they are not kind of only, they, they do not only use the damaged version of the service, but they are also, they are also exposed to often to, to what ads and advertisements in general. So it seems like the, the platforms favors the one-sidedness of the business model when in, in the premium version, while they open the, the, the platform to a two-sidedness in the free version. I would like to know what do you think about it, and if this is the case, how these things can enter in the analysis. Yeah, you're right. I mean, and that's where, again, there is a kind of um, blurred um, boundary between what we call one-sided or two-sided platforms. But you're perfectly right. I mean, for on the free segments, monetization is going to come from another group, which is um, the, the advertisers. And there you've got probably positive cross-group network effects from the free segment on the advertisers, but negative cross-group network effects from advertisers on, uh, on the listeners. Now, again, in the book, we, we try to give some kind of uh, typology of platforms based on how they create value and how they capture value. Uh, 
cre value creation is based on either positive within group network effects or positive cross group network effects. And value capture may be done by introducing another group that generates negative network effects, typically advertising. Okay, but the, the, I mean, I find, I find this separation or this distinction useful because um, these platforms are not based per se to exploit negative um, cross group network effects. They do so as, um, as a way to generate revenues, but they also kill part of the value they create doing so because it makes the platform less attractive for some users, right? Um, so what we bring on top of that is that there is there are these positive within group network effects across users in different segments, which further justifies the monetization strategy uh, through advertising. So this is the, the additional link we make. Now, if I may add one thing about platform definition, uh, first of all, I mean, we define something for a particular purpose and we have ours, which is to analyze the strategies of platforms, understand what kind of impacts they have on markets. Clearly lawyers, for example, would have a different definition. They need to have clear cut boxes in which they can put different firms. So we're not pretending that this is the, I mean, the general and true definition of platforms. I mean, there is nothing like that. Another reason why we, we kind of put one-sided and two-sided platforms or multi-sided platform within the same realm, I would say, is that we are interested in the very decision that platforms make to be one-sided or two-sided. Like we just discussed, is it really worthwhile monetizing the platform by adding a group of advertisers, right? So for us, economists, we understand this is an endogenous decision. And if we were defining things too strictly, we would prevent ourselves from analyzing this very important decision. So that's another reason why we tend to have a kind of broad definition of platforms. But again, if you want to read more, you've got a book coming where we explain all that. And you can disagree, of course. Uh... Awesome. So, and we are already over time, but uh, um, we have another another um, uh, interesting question. So. Um, if everybody agrees, then I'll unmute Eileen to, to ask the question and then um, I can take it from here. Eileen Nielsen. Thank you for the talk. Um, two empirically motivated questions. So first, I wonder, is it important to the equivalence result um, that oh, users be able to self-sort at roughly the same accuracy at which they can be classified by the platform? Because there seems to be this assumption that much of the value is going to come from some kind of behavioral targeting. And then um, regardless of the answers to that, empirically to you, what is what are the interesting assumptions to test um, to kick the tires of this argument generally? Well, a quick answer to the second question. Uh, we haven't thought about that, but I think what would be interesting is really to try and find different profiles of users within this single group. Uh, so why, how would, would it be interesting to segment users in order to benefit from these uh, effects that we, we mentioned in the paper? Um, but well, certainly this is a good question and we need to put more thoughts in that. Regarding your first question, um, I'm not sure I got everything of it, but I'm, I can say that the, the example we built is extremely particular, of course, with having one version that gives the same utility to all users and the other version just giving an extra utility to some users. Okay, if, I mean, as soon as you move from this example and you've got differences in the way the two groups value the two, um, the two uh, versions, well, part of our results remain that incentive compatibility constraints would be non-binding, but you wouldn't be able to reproduce exactly the same profit uh, under versioning that you have under group pricing. Okay, you, you wouldn't have the exact same um, participation levels, basically. Okay, so I, I don't know whether it answers your question, but I just want to stress that we just built a particular um, example to show that this possibility exists. Okay, but this is by no means a, a general um, example. All right, so please join me in thanking Paul Bethlam once again for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, I hope uh, your marketing efforts will uh, turn out nicely. Um, Hopefully, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks for coming. And uh, quick announcement, the, the next white seminar will be in two weeks from now. 
on October 7, we'll have Alessandro Acquisti. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of paper he will present, but given that it's Alessandro, I guess he will talk about privacy. So um, same place, same time, Thursday, October 7, um, 5 p.m., 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. See you all in two weeks. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.